we start our story with a drone shot. For what better way to establish where we are? And don't almost all movies these days start with a drone shot? Where we are is Las Vegas, New Mexico, established almost a hundred years before the gambling mecca by the same name. In its day, it was a prominent trade and cultural center in the Southwest, the biggest city in New Mexico territory, home to a grand opera, grand hotels, a synagogue, banks, streetcars, and was one of the first cities in the country with telephone service. The Santa Fe Railway came here in 1879, and as Las Vegas became the biggest new town on the railroad, historian Howard Bryant says it quickly became the wildest. The lawless history of Las Vegas, New Mexico, has long been one of the best kept secrets in the history of the western frontier, surpassing Tombstone, Deadwood, and Dodge City in violence. For example, Dodge City, Kansas, often regarded as one of the most violent towns in the west, recorded only six or eight killings during its heyday in 1878. Las Vegas, on the other hand, recorded nearly 30 killings during a 30-day period in 1880, its heyday. The strange thing is that despite all that violence, Las Vegas, New Mexico is now known as one of the friendliest towns in the West, the sort of place where strangers will help out strangers without question, and where diversity is welcomed. It's also a big TV and movie location, and home to three busy colleges. Visiting here, you'd probably never guess its violent history, and maybe that's just as well. As the camera lingers on certain scenes about town, as our eyes rest on pleasant sights in the countryside, let the history roll, as written by the late Howard Bryan in his book, Wildest of the Wild West. The images you'll see mostly don't reflect the characters and locations you're hearing about in these stories, but again, are simply to remind us that a dark and tangled history can lurk behind every corner of our little town, or yours. As Chief Justice of the New Mexico Supreme Court during the Civil War era, Kirby Benedict was required to hold court in each of New Mexico's nine counties twice each year. From his home in Santa Fe, Judge Benedict, accompanied by an entourage of lawyers and court officials, traveled on horseback or in horse-drawn vehicles to all parts of the vast territory, pausing in principal communities to hold sessions of district court. During their twice yearly visits to Las Vegas, the judge, lawyers, and court officials often spent their evenings drinking and playing poker at the Exchange Hotel's Buffalo Hall on the southwest corner of the plaza. On one of these occasions, an observer who noted that some of the court officials were illegally gambling at the hotel took the information to the grand jury, then in session, giving the names of those involved. In court the next morning, the names of those indicted on charges of illegal gambling were called out, and one by one, the surprised lawyers stood up and entered guilty pleas. Each paid a fine. When Benedict's name was called, the judge stood up and said, Kirby Benedict enters a plea of guilty, and the court assesses his fine at $10 in costs, and what is more, Kirby Benedict will pay it. During the March term of court in Las Vegas in 1861, the controversial judge also presided over the trial of a woman charged with murder and upon her conviction sentenced her to death by hanging. The few newspapers in New Mexico at the time made no mention of the trial or the hanging, and it was well into the 20th century before some researchers were able to piece the story together from what they said were some old Spanish-language court documents and eyewitness stories handed down through several generations. Most modern accounts identify the condemned Hispanic woman as Paula Angel, although her name also has been given as Pablita Martin and Pablita Sandoval. 
No hint is given of her age or marital status. There is some evidence that she lived along the Sapeo River about a dozen miles north of Las Vegas. Paula Angel was tried before a jury of 12 men upon an indictment charging her with murdering Juan Miguel Martin, who was said to have been her lover. He had broken off his romance with her, the story goes, and she had asked him for a final meeting. During a farewell embrace, she stabbed him to death with a knife she had concealed under her shawl. The jury found her guilty of murder in the first degree, and on March 28, 1861, Judge Benedict sentenced her to be hanged by the neck until dead on Friday, April 26, 1861, between the hours of 10 o'clock in the forenoon and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. In addition, it is said, the judge ordered the woman to pay the entire cost of the action, up to and including the hanging. Antonio Abad Herrera, sheriff of San Miguel County, was ordered to take the condemned woman to a suitable place within the town of Las Vegas and within one mile of the church and carry out the sentence. Paula's attorney, Spruce M. Baird, asked permission to appeal the verdict, and Judge Benedict granted the appeal but ordered that the appeal should in no manner operate as a stay of execution. Sheriff Herrera apparently relished the idea of hanging Paula on hell. It is said he taunted and tormented his prisoner during the month between her conviction and the date of her execution, reminding her each day that she had one less day to live. A large crowd consisting of spectators from miles around gathered in a cottonwood grove at the northeast edge of town on April 26th to witness the hanging of Paula Angel. Sheriff Herrera arrived on the scene driving a wagon. His prisoner, pale and trembling, was seated on her coffin in the back. The sheriff halted the wagon directly beneath a hangman's noose that was dangling from the limb of one of the large cottonwood trees. As the crowd watched silently, the sheriff stood Paula in the wagon bed, placed the noose around her neck, and whipped the wagon team away, leaving her hanging in midair. The sheriff had neglected to tie her arms, however, and she grabbed the rope above her head and tried frantically to pull herself upwards from the strangling noose. Horrified, the sheriff ran to the dangling woman, grabbed her around her waist, and tried to pull her downward to her death. The crowd rushed in, pushed the sheriff away, and cut the gasping woman down, protesting that she had been hanged and that the sentence of the court had been carried out. During the shouting and confusion, José de Sena, a prominent Santa Fe citizen, climbed up on the wagon, calmed the crowd, and read to them the warrant of execution, stressing that it stated that the woman was to be hanged by the neck until dead by four o'clock that day, and that she was not dead, and that it was not yet four o'clock. Once again, Paula and Hale was placed in the wagon, this time with her arms bound. The wagon was driven from beneath her, and she paid the supreme penalty, the first woman to be hanged on the western frontier. Five years later, Judge Benedict was removed from the bench by President Andrew Johnson because of growing reports of his heavy drinking and carousing, thus bringing to an end an otherwise distinguished judicial career. Born in Connecticut in 1810, Benedict had left home at an early age, had lived on an Ohio farm for a while, and had studied law with a prominent attorney in Natchez, Mississippi. As a lawyer in Illinois, he rode circuit for 16 years with fellow lawyers Abraham Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas. President Franklin Pierce appointed him to the bench in New Mexico in 1853. During the Civil War, some prominent Santa Fe citizens wrote to President Lincoln, urging him to remove Benedict as Chief Justice of the New Mexico Supreme Court and replace him with a good, sober man. They complained that the judge frequented saloons and gambling halls and was often seen drunk and reeling around the streets. President Lincoln's reply was short and to the point. Well, gentlemen, I know Benedict. We have been friends for over 30 years. He may imbibe it to excess, but Benedict, drunk, knows more law than all the others on the bench in New Mexico know sober. I shall not disturb him. In 1866, President Andrew Johnson, bowing to increased pressure from New Mexico, removed Benedict from the bench. The judge, considered a distinguished jurist with a sharp legal mind regardless of his other difficulties, died debt-ridden in Santa Fe in 1874. 
Judge Benedict is best remembered for the wording of the death sentence he pronounced upon Jesus Maria Martinez during a court session at Taos in April 1864. A Taos jury convicted Martinez of murder in the death of Julian Trujillo, a blacksmith, a murder described by the New Mexican at Santa Fe as revengeful, vindictive, and wanton. This, according to one of the lawyers who was present, is how Benedict sentenced the young man. Jesus Maria Martinez, stand up. Jesus Maria Martinez, you have been indicted, tried, and convicted by a jury of your countrymen of the crime of murder, and the court is now about to pass upon you the dread sentence of the law. As a usual thing, Jesus Maria Martinez, it is a painful duty for the judge of a court to pronounce upon a human being the sentence of death. There is something horrible about it and the mind of the court naturally revolts from the performance of such a duty. Happily, however, your case is relieved of all such unpleasant features, and the court takes positive delight in sentencing you to death. You are a young man, Jesus Maria Martinez, apparently of good physical condition and robust health. Ordinarily, you might have looked forward to many years of life, and the court has no doubt you have, as you expected to die at the ripe old age but you are about to be cut off in consequence of your own act. Jesus Maria Martinez, it is now springtime. In a little while the grass will be springing up green in these beautiful valleys, and on these broad mesas and mountainsides flowers will be blooming, birds will be singing their sweet carols, and nature will be putting on her most gorgeous and her most attractive robes, and life will be pleasant, and men will want to stay. But none of this for you, Jesus Maria Martinez. The flowers will not bloom for you, Jesus Maria Martinez. The birds will not carol for you, Jesus Maria Martinez. When these things come to gladden the senses of men, you will be occupying a space about six by two beneath the sod, and the green grass and those beautiful flowers will be growing over your lowly head. The sentence of the court is that you be taken from this place to the county jail, and that you be kept there safely and securely confined in the custody of the sheriff until the day appointed for your execution. Be very careful, Mr. Sheriff, that he have no opportunity to escape, and that you have him at the appointed place at the appointed time. That you so be kept, Jesus Maria Martinez, until... Mr. Clerk, on what day of the month does Friday about four weeks from this time come? May 13th, Your Honor. Very well, until Friday the 13th of May, when you will be taken by the sheriff from your place of confinement to some safe and convenient spot within the county. That is in your discretion, Mr. Sheriff. You are only confined to the limits of the county, and that you there be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And the court was about to add, Jesus Maria Martinez, may God grant mercy on your soul. But the court will not assume the responsibility of asking an all-wise providence to do that which a jury of your peers has refused to do. The Lord will not have mercy on your soul. However, if you affect any religious belief or are connected with any religious organization, it might be well for you to send for your priest or your minister and get from him such consolation as you can. But the court advises you to place no reliance upon anything of that kind. Mr. Sheriff, remove the prisoner. In spite of the popular belief that the condemned man escaped, he was hanged on schedule. Manuel Varela walked into the Flores Saloon in Las Vegas at sundown on June 4, 1879, one month before the railroad arrived in town, and asked for a pint of wine. He was in charge of a wagon train owned by his brother, Mariano Varela, a prominent merchant of Las Cruces in southern New Mexico, which had been camped just outside Las Vegas for several days. During that time, Barella had been whooping it up in Las Vegas, visiting the various saloons and gambling dens, and as the Las Vegas Gazette reported, becoming very demonstrative and disagreeable. As the bartender was drawing Barella's pint of wine, the Las Cruces resident turned and noticed two men standing and talking just outside the saloon door. According to one report, Barella bet the bartender that he could shoot the third button off the vest of one of the men. At any rate, Barella drew his six-shooter and fired out the door. The bullet struck one of the men, Jesus Morales, in the face, inflicting a severe but not fatal wound. Benigno Romero, 70-year-old companion of the wounded man, 
was shocked by the unprovoked shooting of Morales, and when Barella came to the door, Romero asked him why he just shot his friend. Morella answered by firing two shots into Romero's body, killing him instantly. Moments later, Las Vegas officers arrived on the scene, arrested Barella, and took him to jail. Many bystanders had witnessed the double shooting, and a large crowd of citizens followed the policemen and their prisoner to the jail, making angry threats to lynch the prisoner. The officers got Barella safely to jail and locked him in a cell. The angry citizens stood outside the closed doors of the jail for a while, hurling insults and threats at the prisoner, but the crowd soon melted away. Referring to Romero, the man who had been slain, the Las Vegas Gazette said, The person killed was a hard-working old man. He had stopped before the saloon to talk of his next work day. He was an entire stranger to Barella, and neither he nor his companion had given him the slightest pretext for offense. The shooting was entirely without provocation, a devilish and crazy freak which should not go unpunished. All available officers were placed on guard duty at the jail that night to safeguard the prisoner from any lynch mob. The evening passed quietly, however, with no sign of trouble. Then at midnight, the silence was broken by the sounds of gunshots on a nearby hill. Somebody called for the police, and the policeman on guard duty at the jail rushed to the scene of the supposed trouble. As soon as the officers had left, a large crowd of citizens moved silently upon the jail and overpowered the few guards left on duty. Two of them knocked at the door of the jail and informed the jailer that they had come to deliver a prisoner. When he opened the door, the mob moved in and overpowered him. The citizens forced the jailer to hand over the keys to Barella's cell. They took Barella from his cell, and apparently on second thought, also took custody of another prisoner, Giovanni Duggi, an Italian held on a murder charge. The two men were dragged to the barren plaza in the center of town. Standing near the center of the plaza was an odd-shaped windmill, erected in 1876 over a well. Built entirely of wood, the windmill consisted of two parts, a large platform held about 20 feet above the ground by four sturdy posts, and a narrowing superstructure that rose about another 20 feet from the platform. Wood ladders led up to the platform and onto the top. In bright moonlight, Morella was hanged from the windmill, and when he expired, Duji met the same fate. In half a minute after the hanging was accomplished, the Gazette reported, the plaza was perfectly clear of people and the town was as quiet as a graveyard. It was about this same time, according to Miguel A. Otero in his book, My Life on the Frontier, that the hanging windmill claimed yet another victim. Otero, a Las Vegas pioneer who served as governor of New Mexico from 1897 to 1906, identified this victim as a cowboy visitor named Beckworth who enjoyed demonstrating his skills at handling a pistol. While twirling his pistol in his hand before an admiring audience, the gun went off and killed the man standing behind him. Beckworth apologized, saying it was just an accident. He resumed his pistol twirling and the gun went off again, this time killing a woman standing in the doorway of her house just across the street. Again, Beckworth apologized, saying it was just an accident. Officers quickly arrived on the scene and hauled Beckworth off to jail. He was found hanging from the windmill the next morning, Otero said, with a placard hanging from his neck which said, This is no accident. Four cowboy desperados bent on having a good time, seeing the sights and letting off a little steam, arrived in Las Vegas one day in January 1880 and began making the rounds of the saloons, gambling halls, and places of ill repute. The four, according to the optic, paraded the streets armed to the teeth and laughed at law officers who suggested that they check their weapons until they were ready to leave town. The leader of the group, who called himself Tom Henry, was a 21-year-old cowboy who reportedly had a checkered career in Texas. His companions were known as John Dorsey, James West, and William Randall. The group reportedly had come to the region to steal horses. On the night of January 22nd, after several days of making a general nuisance of themselves, flouting law officers and becoming drunker by the hour, the four entered the crowded Close and Patterson dance hall in East Las Vegas, armed with their pistols. Joe Carson, the 40-year-old town marshal, 
approached the cowboys and asked them to check their guns. They laughed in his face. Carson repeated his request, and the answer was a barrage of profane insults, which suddenly became a barrage of bullets. The cowboys drew their guns and opened fire on the marshal, who managed to pull his gun from his hip pocket and fire two shots before falling to the floor with nine bullets in his body. David Mysterious Dave Mather, assistant town marshal who was standing nearby, drew his revolver and opened fire on the cowboys. It was estimated that 40 shots were fired in the dance hall during the battle. When the smoke had cleared, it was found that one of the cowboys, William Randall, was dead on the floor, as was Marshal Carson. Another of the cowboys, James West, was down with a bullet through his middle, but still alive. Tom Henry, shot in the calf of his leg, escaped out the door and limped to the Llewellyn and Olds Corral, where at gunpoint he ordered an employee of the corral to begin saddling up horses. He didn't know at the moment how many horses would be needed, for he didn't know how many of his companions were in a condition to join him. Henry was joined at the corral in a moment by John Dorsey, who had escaped unharmed. The two rode out of town at a gallop, Henry threatening to wreak vengeance on the damned town by laying it in ashes, according to newspaper reports. James West, the wounded man left behind, was hauled off to jail. The optic on January 24th told of a visit to the slain marshal's widow. Today we visited Mrs. Carson, who is heartbroken and disconsolate over the brutal murder of her husband. She has his garments, which are perforated with bullet holes, carefully folded away in her trunk. There are eight bullet holes in his coat and one in his boot, showing that he was shot nine times. The badges worn by Joe, as well as his rings, pocket knife, money, in fact everything he had on his person that bloody night with a lock of his hair, have been carefully laid aside and many times will she weep over them. On the night he met his death, Joe had two revolvers on his person, one in a scabbard around his body and one in his hip pocket. The chambers of the latter one were empty, and, as traces of blood are visible, it is thought that poor Joe managed to get it out of his pocket and fire two shots at his assailants. The chambers in the latter one were empty, and, as traces of blood are visible, it is thought that poor Joe managed to get it out of his pocket and fire two shots at his assailants. The newspaper added that the Carsons were the parents of a 14-year-old daughter who was attending school in Nashville, Tennessee. The marshal's father was living near Rome, Georgia, the article continued, and Mrs. Carson planned to return to the home of her parents in Chicago after the funeral of her husband. The optic in the same issue opined that mysterious Dave, who had come through the battle unharmed, was bulletproof. Dave Mather is bulletproof. A ball passed through both coats he had on at the shooting affair Thursday night. About two weeks later, the proprietors of the Llewellyn and Olds Corral learned that the two horses that had been appropriated at the corral by the cowboys who were escaping had been seen north in Mora County. Charles Olds and Harry Combs rode to Mora, which was the county seat, about 30 miles to the north, and then returned to Las Vegas on February 2nd with the recovered horses and with word that Henry and Dorsey were hiding out in a farmhouse near Mora, waiting for Henry's leg wound to heal before hightailing it out of the country. A group of heavily armed East Las Vegas lawmen and deputies climbed into a wagon on the afternoon of February 5th and started for Mora. The posse, according to the optic, included J.J. Webb, William L. Goodlett, Bill Combs, Dave Rudabaugh, Lee Smith, and a man identified only as Muldoon. Most or all of them were considered members of Hoodoo Brown's Dodge City Gang. Arriving in Mora that night, the posse spent its duration in Thomas Walton's hotel. Rising early next morning, they proceeded to the farmhouse where the two fugitives were believed to be hiding. The Las Vegas group was accompanied to the farm by A.P. Branch, sheriff of Mora County, and John Doherty, a local rancher. The posse reached and took up positions around the farmhouse at about 10 a.m. on February 6th and called upon the fugitives to surrender. Henry, whom the optic said would rather fight than eat, refused to surrender and prepared to defend himself. His companion, Dorsey, persuaded him to give up without a fight, however, and the two agreed to surrender on condition that they would be protected from any mob violence in Las Vegas. The posse, with its two prisoners in a wagon, reached Las Vegas that afternoon, and the two were subsequently placed in jail with their wounded companion, West. 
Henry and Dorsey had been reluctant to talk about the dance hall shootings with their captors during the ride to Las Vegas. The Optic reported on February 7th that Henry had made the only reference to the fatal fuss and attributed the whole difficulty to whiskey, adding, however, in speaking of this lamentable affair, his demeanor all the time was unruffled and nonchalant, as if he were the guest of a party instead of a man under arrest for a foul, cowardly murder for which he may be jerked to Jesus before the sun rises again. Interviewed at the jail by an optic reporter, Henry said he was drunk at the time of the dance hall battle and did not know what he was doing. The article added, he remarked further that when a fellow of his disposition got too much whiskey on board, he lost control of himself and was driven to deeds, the enormity of which were not realized until more sober moments. The optics prediction on February 7th that Henry would be jerked to Jesus before the sun rises again proved to be accurate. That night, about 100 Las Vegas citizens gathered silently in the streets and marched to the jail. They battered down the door, demanded and received the keys to the cells from the jailer, opened cell doors, and led Henry and Dorsey out with ropes around their necks. The wounded Webb was carried from his cell. Leading and carrying the prisoners through the dark streets to the West Las Vegas Plaza, the mob halted at the windmill at the center of the plaza, the hanging windmill, and dragged the three up to the windmill platform, the ropes still around their necks. The nooses were adjusted and the other ends of the ropes looped up over the beams in the windmill superstructure. The three were asked if they had anything to say before being hanged. Tom Henry replied that his true name was Thomas Jefferson House and requested that somebody write to his parents, Mr. and Mrs. U.B. House in Pueblo, Colorado. Boys, it's pretty rough to be hung, but I wish someone would write to my father and mother, he said. I will stand the consequence and die like a man. James West said only that his real name was James Lowe although it was determined later that he was Anthony Lowe from Kansas. James Dorsey said nothing of his background, declaring that he had not a friend or relative in the world. West, suffering from his wounds and shivering in the cold, was selected to be the first to pay the penalty. When he began to whimper, Henry turned to him and said, Jim, be still and die like a man. Boys, you are hanging a mighty good man, West said, regaining his composure. His last words before he swung up in the air were, please button up my pants. At that moment, according to some of the reports, Joe Carson's widow, who was in the crowd, picked up a rifle and began shooting at the three victims. General gunfire then erupted as the mob followed her lead. Tom Henry, falling to his knees in the ensuing hail of bullets, crawled to the edge of the windmill platform, pleading, Boys, for God's sake, shoot me again, shoot me in the head. In a moment, all three were dead in pools of blood on the windmill platform. Each man later was placed in a coffin, and the three were buried in a single grave. The Optic on February 9th published the verdict of the West Las Vegas coroner's jury. We, the justice of the peace and jury, who sat upon the inquest held this day, February 8, 1880, on the body of three men whose names are Tom Henry, John Dorsey, and James West, found on the public plaza, find that the two former persons came to death by several shots in their heads, and the latter one by signs of being hanged by the neck by some person or persons unknown at about two or three o'clock in the morning on the day as above stated. We also found that the doors of the jail were broken open, and from investigation we learned that the above men were taken out of their cells by a mob unknown to this jury. Signed Arthur Morrison, J.P., Charles Elfeld, M. Whiteman, Teodosio Lucero, H. Romero, Antonio Jose Baca, J. Felipe Baca. Another brief item in the optic the same day said, There is a petition in circulation to have the windmill torn down. It is too great a temptation. The hanging windmill was torn down the same day, not only because it was a great temptation, but also because it was a bad influence on the children of Las Vegas. As the Las Vegas Gazette reported on February 10th, 
The wind pump in the plaza by the repeated tragedies exacted thereon became of such bad memory that the citizens determined that it should come down, and a purse was raised and a carpenter sent to work yesterday who took down the scaffold close to the foundation. The bad effects of such sights on children cannot be realized. Yesterday boys were hanging dogs all over town, and many a poor dog had his neck stretched just by force of example. Although mysterious Dave Mather and John Joshua Webb gave inadequate pay as a reason for their leaving Hoodoo Brown's police force, the Las Vegas Optic reported on March 3, 1880, that it was the impending collapse of the Dodge City Gang and possible murder indictments that most influenced their hasty decisions. The demise of the gang of desperados that had ruled East Las Vegas since the coming of the railroad was brought about by the unprovoked killing of Michael Kelleher in an East Las Vegas saloon during the early morning hours of March 2nd. Kelleher, a 28-year-old freighter, rancher, and former Chicago policeman, arrived in Las Vegas on a Sunday night, February 29th, his pants pockets bulging with a wad of more than $2,000 in currency. He was the owner of three freight teams, and his brother, Morris Kelleher of Cheyenne, Wyoming, owned a ranch in the Dakotas. Michael had traveled south into New Mexico from Deadwood with the money to buy cattle. While camped on the trail a day out of Las Vegas, Kelleher had taken the money from his pants pocket and counted it in front of his traveling companion, William Brickley. The count came to $2,115. Kelleher told Brinkley that he would deposit most of it in a bank as soon as they reached Las Vegas. Upon reaching Las Vegas on Sunday night, the two camped at the edge of town. Kelleher had no opportunity to deposit the money in a bank on Monday, however, for he spent the entire day trailing some horses that had strayed off from his camp that morning and had headed back north up the trail. Kelleher returned to camp with the horses at sundown. He and Brickley cooked and ate their supper, then walked into town to see the sights and enjoy some of the nightlife. They visited a dance hall in West Las Vegas, then crossed the bridge to East Las Vegas and made the rounds of the dance halls and saloons in the new town. The fact that Kelleher carried a large sum of money in his pocket did not go unnoticed. Returning to their camp at about 3 o'clock in the morning, the two stopped for a final drink at the Goodlett and Roberts Saloon, a favorite hangout for Hoodoo Brown, Dutchie, and others of the Dodge City gang. They met an acquaintance in the saloon and had been there from 30 to 45 minutes when Officer J.J. Webb walked in and shot Kelleher dead. H.G. Neal, Hoodoo Brown, arrived quickly on the scene and impaneled the coroner's jury of his friends in his capacity as acting coroner. The jury ruled that the deceased came to his death from a pistol in the hands of J.J. Webb, being an officer in the discharge of his duty, and the killing was justifiable and necessary under the circumstances. What were the circumstances? Witnesses, including William Goodlett, one of the proprietors of the saloon who was known to work hand in glove with the Dodge City Gang, testified that Kelleher was drunk and boisterous, had threatened to kill a policeman, was singing songs, and at one point had asked the bartender if he had any war clubs, saying he wanted to show how he could use them. The witnesses said Webb entered the saloon, asked Kelleher for his gun, and then shot him when Kelleher jumped back and placed his hand on his pistol. This testimony was in conflict with the testimony given by Brickley, Kelleher's companion, who was described as being a large, red-complected man with blue eyes and a slight brogue. Brickley said that Kelleher had not threatened anybody, but was leaning on his elbow on the bar when Webb walked in, ordered him to throw up his hands, and immediately shot him to death. A few hours after the shooting, Hoodoo Brown went to Charles Blanchard, San Miguel County probate judge, and asked permission to serve as administrator of Kelleher's estate. The Justice of the Peace and Acting Coroner said that he had taken $1,090 from the body of the deceased during the inquest at the saloon. A question of bond arose, and Blanchard said he would think about the matter. While he was thinking, it was brought to light that Hoodoo had taken $860 more from the dead man's pocket than he had reported. A grand jury, which was in session in the courthouse in West Las Vegas at the time, investigated the Kelleher shooting and heard evidence that Kelleher had been the victim of a conspiracy to obtain his money. 
the jury quickly returned indictments charging H.J. Webb with first-degree murder and charging H.G. Neal, alias Hoodoo Brown, with larceny. Webb was arrested Thursday afternoon, March 4th, by three deputy sheriffs, but the deputies could find no trace of Hoodoo Brown. The Optic on Friday, March 5th, reported the arrest of Webb and added, H.G. Neal, vulgarly known as Hoodoo Brown, went east Wednesday night in company with Dutchie, against whom an indictment was returned by the grand jury. After the killing of Kelleher, the money in his possession, said to be $1,950 instead of only $1,000. Ninety dollars, as given to the reporters, fell into the hands of Neil, who was justice of the peace and acting coroner. The funeral expenses were borne, and Neil put the rest of the money in his pocket and skipped for parts unknown. The optic said that Neil and Dutchy had boarded a train in Las Vegas on Wednesday night and had last been seen the next morning up the line at Otero, where they had had breakfast. On the way north, the newspaper said, Neil had exhibited a large roll of greenbacks to the conductor. Neil gave Dutchie $150 and the two parted, Dutchie heading to the north towards Alamosa, Colorado, and Neil heading to the east into Kansas. In what first appeared to be an unrelated incident, the widow of Joe Carson, the town marshal who had been killed in the January 22nd dance hall battle, had the body of her late husband exhumed from a Las Vegas cemetery and boarded an eastbound train with the coffin two nights after the sudden departure of Hoodoo Brown. The optic reported on Saturday, March 6th, Mrs. Carson left for Houston, Texas, taking with her the remains of her late husband. Mrs. Carson has had a more varied experience than many women of her age. She at one time served as a detective for Alan Pinkerton, but had not been engaged in the Secret Service for nine months in deference to the wishes of her late husband. On Monday, March 8th, the U.S. Marshal's Office in Parsons, Kansas, received an urgent telegram from Las Vegas reading, Arrest Hyman G. Neal, alias Hoodoo Brown, about six feet in height, light hair and mustache, weighs about 140, slim and active, blue eyes, addressed in a plaid gray suit, going to Houston, Texas, waiting there for a lady accompanying the corpse of her husband. I have a warrant for him. $200 for his capture. Governor of New Mexico will undoubtedly offer more. We'll take the train tomorrow for Houston. Signed, D. Romero, Sheriff of San Miguel County, New Mexico. A deputy U.S. Marshal in Parsons located and arrested Neal that same day at the Belmont House, where he had been staying while awaiting the arrival of Mrs. Carson. The widow arrived on the noon train and the Parsons' son reported that the meeting between the pair after the man was arrested is said to have been affecting in the extreme and rather more affectionate than would be expected under the circumstances. Another newspaper, the Parsons' Eclipse, added that the offense committed at Las Vegas, as near as we can gather the facts relating to it, was murder and robbery, and the circumstances connected with the arrest here would indicate that the lesser crime of seduction and adultery was connected with it. Neal, who first insisted that his name was Henry Graham, hired two local attorneys, petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus, and was released when the officers failed to show any legal authority for holding him in custody. His female companion went south on the MK and T Tuesday noon, the Parsons' son reported. He started several hours ahead on horseback. They will doubtless meet again further south. In a proclamation signed by Acting Governor W.G. Rich at Santa Fe on March 15, 1880, a reward of $300 was offered for the apprehension and detention of H.G. Neal and the delivery of him to the Sheriff of San Miguel County. The Chicago Times, reporting on the scandalous affair in Las Vegas, said that the Justice of the Peace, the Marshal's widow, and the coffin have been skylarking through some of the interior towns of Kansas ever since. Although Mrs. Carson still clings to her old love, she follows faithfully in the wanderings of her new mash. The Optic on March 15th published a letter it had received from Neil, mailed March 11th in Muskogee, Indian Territory, in which the fugitive said he planned to return to Las Vegas to answer the indictment against him. I must tell you my motive for leaving Las Vegas as I did, he wrote, and continued, I had no intention ten hours before I started. On the night that I left, a man came to me and said there was going to be an indictment found against myself, 
Webb and Dave Mather for killing someone, and that I would be arrested the next day and thrown in jail. Well, this so frightened me that I deliberately packed my valise and told everybody I met that I would leave. Morris Kelleher, brother of the murder victim, arrived in Las Vegas on March 10th and made arrangements to have the remains of his brother exhumed and shipped to McHenry County, Illinois, where their parents lived, for reburial. He also asked to be deputized to go hunt Hoodoo Brown. As an April Fool's joke, The Optic on April 1st published a story saying that Neil had been captured, returned to Las Vegas in chains, and that he was being held under guard at the St. Nicholas Hotel in East Las Vegas. Crowds of curious persons were taken in by the joke, flocking to the hotel to see the prisoner. But Hyman G. Neal, alias Hoodoo Brown, had shaken the dust of Las Vegas from his feet forever. Like mysterious Dave, he vanished to an unknown fate. With the sudden departure of Hoodoo Brown and Dave Mather and the jailing of J.J. Webb for murder, the rule of the Dodge City Gang in Las Vegas was brought to an end. There were violent repercussions for a long time to come, however. James Moorhead, a traveling salesman for several St. Louis wholesale houses, arrived in Las Vegas during the last week in February 1880 and checked in at the St. Nicholas Hotel in the new town. Moorhead, a 40-year-old bachelor, was a neatly dressed man who enjoyed the finer things of life. He expected and demanded the best of service wherever he stopped, whether it was a refined eastern city or a rough frontier town like Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, the traveling salesman had the nerve to keep arriving in the hotel dining room late for his meals and insisting that he be served fried eggs. What happened to him as a result was brought out at the coroner's inquest a few days later. Moorhead first appeared late for supper in the St. Nicholas dining room on a Friday night. He asked the waiter, 23-year-old James Allen, if he could have fried eggs for his supper. The waiter, who had operated a saloon in Leadville, Colorado, before drifting to Las Vegas, said he would ask the cook. Returning moments later, Allen told the salesman that the cook was too busy to fry any eggs and that he would have to take his supper without them. Saturday morning, Moore had arrived in the dining room late for breakfast and again asked for fried eggs. Allen told him that he was too late for eggs, that the cook was already preparing dinner and didn't have time to bother with them. Moorhead was late for breakfast again Sunday morning, but managed to get his eggs. Asking for eggs again that evening at supper, Moorhead was told that he could have eggs after the rush was over, but when the rush had subsided, he told Alan he had lost his appetite and did not want any eggs. Thursday morning, March 2nd, Moorhead once again was late for breakfast. He was in good spirits as the day before he had sold a stock of liquor to the Charles Ilfeld Company. He asked the waiter if he could have eggs for breakfast, and Alan, losing patience, told the salesman he could always have eggs if he would just come for his meals at the proper times. The salesman was not ready to let the matter drop, however. Words followed, and Alan told Moorhead that he didn't care to hear any more about the subject. If he were dissatisfied, he should complain to the proprietor. You needn't get up on your left ear about it, Moorhead exclaimed. Your constant racket about eggs is enough to put anybody on his ear, Alan retorted. Please go to hell, the salesman said. I don't care to, the waiter answered, but you can go as quick as you want to. Moorhead stood up from the table and rolled up his sleeves. If you want anything out of me, you can get it, he said. The two men went into a clinch. Moorhead managed to pick Alan up and carry the struggling waiter way across the dining room. In the scuffling, he fell over some chairs, falling to the floor with the waiter beneath him. Others in the dining room managed to separate the two men. Alan immediately ran behind the bar, picked up a beer bottle, and started for Moorhead again. He dropped the bottle when he saw Moorhead put his hand behind him, as if reaching for a weapon. The waiter ran into the kitchen, borrowed a revolver from a dishwasher, and returned to the dining room, gun in hand. He demanded that Moorhead apologize. Moorhead, stooping slightly, advanced slowly towards the waiter, who retreated slowly into the kitchen. When Moorhead reached the kitchen door, Alan pulled the trigger. The salesman slumped to the floor, fatally wounded. Moorhead died at 10 o'clock that night, 12 hours after he was shot. A coroner's jury, after hearing the waiter's testimony, 
ruled that James Moorhead had come to his death by a pistol shot fired by James Allen and that the killing was willing, malicious, and felonious murder and without justification or provocation whatsoever. Allen was taken to the county jail to await trial.